I am so glad that you are all here right now because as we've just seen, there's a lot in life that's really hard and difficult and painful going on. And I suspect that if you're here, you're here partly because you're hoping that God maybe has some word of comfort or hope for you in the midst of the difficulties of life. And so I have really good news. I know the source of all of your pain in life. English grammar. Grammar has been ruining your lives since grade school. But I believe that if you listen carefully today, grammar will actually become the thing that saves your life and mine. Now, I know you're probably thinking that that is a foolish and bold claim for me to make. So hold on to your hats or whatever articles of clothing you're actually wearing, because I am going to start today by blowing your minds. Have you ever realized that the English language that you and I all speak has no future tense? I'm serious, think about it. English does not have a future tense. Most languages, they have a past tense, present tense, future tense, not English. Let me show you, because I, I think you probably don't believe me. This is the infinitive of a regular English verb, to walk, right, walk. But you can conjugate the verb to change its tense. You can put an S on the end, and now it's he walks in the present tense. Or you can conjugate it, put an ED on the end, he walked in the past tense. Uh, you can even put an ING on there, and now it's a present continuous walking. But now notice this, what can you put on the end of this word to make it a future tense? Try to conjugate this to make it future. You can't. You see, most Indo-European languages, which is the family of languages that English is in, you can totally do this. You can conjugate a verb, put something on the end to make it future. Spanish, for example, you just put an accented vowel on the end of the infinitive, boom, future tense. Or even Greek, the language that the New Testament of the Bible was written in, you put a sigma here in front of the present conjugation, and now it's future tense. But English, can't do it. There's no future tense in English. Now there is a, a weird thing that English has that other languages don't have. There is a perilous tense in English. I'll show you what I mean. You can put an ER on the end. Boom. <laughs> Be very careful. Do not invoke the Chuck Norris conjugation unless you are ready for it. All right, but let's talk about what's going on here. Why is English weird? What is it that's going on? This thing that we have just never even noticed or taken for granted about our language. Stan Latore is a Bible translator and novelist, and he uh, says it this way. He says, English doesn't have as many tenses as some languages do. For example, English didn't originally have a future tense, and it still doesn't have one in a technical sense today. You see, the ancient Anglo-Saxons, which is part of our ancestors linguistically, the future was uncertain. You couldn't say definite things about the future. You could only say what you intend, what you desire, or what you will to happen, or maybe what the gods will to happen. And if you will it strongly enough and the gods are not against you, maybe it will happen just so. And so you would say, I will to build a boat, or it is my will that I build a boat or I will to fight him, it is my will that I fight him. And because that's way too many words and it takes too long, we shorten it to I will build a boat and I will fight him. But what we're technically saying is that it's my desire to build a boat tomorrow. It's my will that this happen, or it's God's will, or it's someone's will that a thing happen after this present moment because English grammar doesn't include an actual future tense. Yeah. 
Do you ever realize that? that? This thing that we don't even notice, this language we speak so naturally, it represents a philosophical truth that the way our language was built was built around this idea and understanding of the uncertainty of the future. But now I'm going to explode your mind even further because this weird linguistic thing about English is actually biblical. It's totally a biblical thing. Let me show you. We're gonna go to the book of James. And now just to help with confusion, there are two Jameses in the Bible. Uh, and so the one who wrote the book of James, uh, the, 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 his nickname is actually James the Lesser, which is the worst nickname ever. I feel so bad for James. But so James the Lesser uh, wrote a book of the Bible and, and I wanna show you what, what he says in that book. He writes, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. And now again, Greek does have a future tense. So they didn't say we will go, they said go. And then they put that little conjugation on the end to make it future. And so today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there. We'll carry on business. We'll make lots of money. And he says, hang on, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, you ought not to use the future tense of Greek. And instead you should say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that thing. Our Anglo-Saxons, our Anglo-Saxon ancestors were doing exactly what James told them they should do in the Bible. You guys realize what this means? This means, I'm just gonna say it, English is the most Christian language. You and I, we are reading the Bible the way God intended us to, in English. <laughs> but what it also means in a very real way, you and I have no future. And that is both grammatically, technically accurate, but existentially terrifying. And this is where we need to lean into some of the divine grammar of scripture in our passages today, because here's the truth. You and I, this is not just about the way we speak, it's the way life is. We live with a conditional future. We have no control over the future tense. The future is uncertain, which makes it really scary. And so we spend our lives, it's human nature. We spend our lives trying to, to, to spend money and time and effort in an effort to make the future less uncertain. We invest in stocks, we have retirement savings, we, we have social security and Medicare and all of these things are so that the future's less scary and less uncertain. We listen to the pundits and the people uh, who tell us where we should invest or who we should vote for because those are the things that gonna make the future more predictable, more safe. But is it actually working? Does your future feel any less scary now that we have 401ks and financial planners? I've shared this before from the pulpit, but I feel I need to share it again, that, that I have had to confront an idol in my own life. See, I have to admit that for much of my life, I have often felt like I was a better Christian because I've always been extremely optimistic about my future. I've always just assumed that my life is gonna work out and I attributed that, that confidence and optimism to my faith but I was only half right. I did have faith, but it wasn't actually faith in God the way I thought it was. You see, it turns out I really just had faith in being a citizen of a stable and predictable country. Not only that, in fact, the last remaining superpower in the world. My faith was actually in the stability of American society. And, and I learned that from my parents and my Air Force parents drilled it into me that if you work hard and you have integrity, then, then the systems and the structures of our society will reward you for it. That you'll have a successful career, you'll be able to buy a house, you'll amass plenty of retirement savings so that you can enjoy your golden years. And here's the thing that's actually worked out for my parents just like that. But I'm afraid that the boomers might be the last generation that that's ever actually true for. See, as it stands now, I'm, I'm really afraid that social security won't last. I'm afraid that our American institutions are crumbling. 
I'm afraid that most millennials and Gen Z will never be able to afford a house of their own. I'm afraid that we are minutes away from Russia just deciding to nuke as much of the world as it can, just out of spite. And that supposed faith-based Christian optimism that I took for granted for so long has just completely cratered over the last five years. I'm extremely anxious and uncertain about the future because the thing that I had truly put my source of trust in has let me down. Because in fact, I'd put my own future tense under the control of imperfect human institutions. So how about you? Have any of you ever made that same mistake that I have? Where you thought you were trusting in God, but you were actually trusting in one of the good gifts of God, like a stable paycheck or a physically fit body or a system that rewarded your natural giftings or maybe a person who you thought would never leave you. And that works for a while, but, but then the paycheck goes away. Your amazing body gets old or gets cancer. Technology disrupts the market so that it no longer values what you can contribute. Or that person that you thought would always be there walks away or passes away. But it's in that moment of pain and realization that you and I are given a crossroads opportunity to put our trust in the future where it should have been all along. See, in, in those moments, we can choose to give our future tense back to God. And in fact, that's what our passage today is about. Psalm 37 provides a guide for us for how to restore our future tense to where it should have been when we are at that pivotal crossroads of a crumbling hope and uncertainty. So we're gonna be in Psalm 37. I want you to just hear these words of wisdom, these ancient words that are still helpful and powerful today. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good, and then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord, and he wills to give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he wills to help you. God wills to make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Beautiful and comforting words. So much truth and wisdom to explore in this Psalm. Um, so there are a few points I want to make to you uh, as, we, as we go back through this and, and look at it in more depth. Uh, and the first one is this, is that the Psalm points out what the natural human uh, impulse is when we are faced with the uncertainty of the future, when things feel scary, the thing that we almost all will naturally do is we get mad. And so it says, verse eight, look what it says, it says to us. In, in the midst of these fears, in the midst of uncertainties, stop being angry, turn from your age, do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. And notice that word only. It doesn't say sometimes it leads to harm or be careful. There's going to be a temptation if you're angry that it might lead to harm. He says it only leads to harm. The Old Testament that we tend to think is the one that's full of wrath and righteous anger and all these things. In the Old Testament, he's saying, no, anger's not good, not healthy, not holy. It only leads to harm. Most English translations actually will change this word. They translate it evil. It's only evil. And this has been important for me to recognize because for much of my life, when I have seen Christians be angry, I have assumed it was because they were righteous. 
And yet I've come to embrace what Psalm 37 teaches that when Christians are angry, it is always because they're scared. And so what I have started to do the last few years is that when, when I see Christians get angry, angry at other people, sometimes angry at me, instead of engaging with the terms of the debate, I, I try to, to push through this and say, what is it that you're afraid is going to happen? You're so mad right now, you're so heightened, everything's so big. What is the fear? What is the concern that is underlying this posture? Because that's the question that matters. Because when we're acting this way, it's, it's not because we're standing for God's truth, it's because we are fearful of something about the future. And I'll tell you this, what's even harder than asking other Christians that question is asking myself the same question. When I find myself that with the rage building up, the frustration, the, the anger, and I have to stop and ask myself, what am I afraid is gonna happen? Well, what is my anger trying to protect me from? because it's trying to protect me from something. And if you get angry, it's trying to protect you from something too. Which brings us to, to the, uh, the next important divine grammar for us to understand that when we ask that question, what are you afraid of? Be prepared, it's going to provoke a response because of a secret Hebrew tense called the Hithbael, the Hithbael. Now, again, uh, this is a thing you've probably never heard of. I wanna give credit here. Heath Lumen is one of our school teachers. He's the one that actually pointed this out to me. He is an even bigger grammar nerd than I am. And we were going over Psalm 37 together. And he said, Doug, you realize what's, what's happening in Psalm 37, the Hithpael. And I said, Heath, the Hithpael. And I know you're thinking, wow, the Hithpael. So let me tell you this. This is a tense that English does not have. Maybe Hebrew is slightly more Christian than English, maybe just a little bit, because Hebrew has this tense. It's a really cool uh, and rare tense called the Hithbael. And here's the best I can describe it, is it's uh, an intensive causative action in a reflexive voice. Okay, so what that's saying is it's a way to take a verb and make it really big, and then saying, Andrew, it's something that you're forcing to happen, you're creating it, and the reflexive voice means you do it to yourself. Reflexive voice is, is it's not something that someone else says to us, a reflexive voice means you do it to yourself. And when you ask someone the question, what are you afraid of? You are, you are engaging in the Hithpael, and it can be a little, be a little unsettling. Let me, let me show you what I mean. I wanna point you to three spots in Psalm 37, uh, verse one, verse seven, and verse eight. And the English translation that we just heard of all those was first one, it said, do not worry, do not fret, do not lose your temper. I wanna tell you this, all three of those spots are actually the same single word, same word. Now this word has a lot of meanings, which is why they've translated it with worry and fret and temper, but it's the same original word the whole time. And then not only that, this word is in the same tense, the Hithpael. And since we don't have a Hithpael, it gets translated into a simple present tense imperative. So it just turns into, don't worry, don't fret, don't lose your temper. It just sounds like a simple present tense command. That is not what is going on in these three verses. These are Hithpaels. And I went through all the English translations and none of them really captured it well enough. So I had to go to a translation that I think is a much better one. It's called the debate version of the Bible. Uh, and that's how the debate version of the Bible translates it. That stands for uh, Doug's emotionally balanced and much more accurate translation in English. Uh, of the Bible, um, this is the best one. And if you have an issue with me, we'll debate about it, uh, we'll, we'll argue. Here is what I think is a far more uh, true emotional connotation of what these three verses are actually saying. It's saying, do not habitually intentionally fan your own flames of worry into a roaring fire of anger. That's so much better. But it's also a lot lengthier. I see why, why they did this. This is, a, this is a really complex, awkward thing to say because we don't have a Hithpael. You have to use all of these extra words to communicate what's going on. But this is so powerful and important because without the Hithpael, the Bible actually looks oversimplistic and foolish. Because it looks like what the Bible is saying is, oh, you're worried about the future, you're scared, you're freaked out. Well, stop it. And you know, if you have any emotional intelligence at all, that this is not a wise or a helpful thing for anyone to say ever. Let me give you an example. If my kid comes to me in the middle of the night and they say, dad, I think I'm afraid there's a monster in my closet. I'm so scared. I'm having nightmares. I don't want to sleep. 
as a wise, loving dad, would I ever say to my child, do not be scared, go back to bed? Would that be effective at all? Uh, of course not. That, that wouldn't be compassionate or helpful or wise at all. And yet that, that's what it looks like, Scripture's saying, because of the oversimplification in English, because we don't have the hip pile. But what it's actually saying is this, that you can be scared and you can be worried, and that's legitimate. But in that moment, you have a choice. You can choose to start an anxious cycle. You can let that worry be something that you that consumes your thoughts, that you just start thinking about it and letting it build up in intensity and just inflicting it on yourself more and more and more until it just erupts out of you in a blazing fire of anger. See, in the Hebrew scripture's not diminishing our pain, our fear, our worry. It's not diminishing it at all, but it's reminding us that you and I always have a choice that we can take those legitimate things that concern us, those things that worry us, and we can choose to short circuit the cycle of concern. And instead of perseverating and letting it all build up, we, we can say, you know what, I, I'm gonna take this fear and this concern. I'm gonna ask myself the question. I'm gonna ask someone else, what is it that I'm afraid of? And instead of letting it stay under the surface until it builds up, builds up and erupts like a volcano, I'm gonna put it out here. I'm gonna examine it and I'm gonna do something healthier with that worry, that fear, that concern. And then Psalm 37 is awesome because then it tells us what is the healthy, right thing to do with that fear once we've exposed it, once the Hithpael helps us realize what we're doing to ourselves. And then it introduces us to our second piece of divine grammar, the present future tension. As I've already shared, we have no control over the future tense. The future tense is God's purview, but we do have control over the present tense. There is something we can always do here and now today. And when we faithfully do the present tense actions that God has given us to do, it actually has this result of increasing our future hope. And so I'm gonna go through these next few verses of Psalm 37 and I want you to notice the present tense, future tense tension that it's got going on. Let's look at it. Present tense, trust in the Lord right now. Do good right now because then you will, future tense, live safely in the land and prosper. Right now, take delight in the Lord because in the future, he will give you your heart's desires. Here and now, in this moment, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will in the future help you. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. So here and now in the present, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently but confidently for him to act. See, this is the power that we can do things. We're not powerless. We don't have to just sit there and, and, and hope things work out. We are choosing in the moment to make present actions that will increase our future hope. And I wanna go back through these verses again. And this time I wanna go through them for, for two reasons for you. One is I want you to let them wash over you, that these are the promises of God, promises that he's made for you. And, and to let them fill whatever it is in you that is fearful and anxious and scared and let God's promise plug into that. And, but secondly, as you know, I'm a big fan of Christians memorizing Bible verses because it's in internalizing those and, and, and really locking them in that they start to transform our hearts and minds. And so what I'll also suggest to you is as I go through them again, be looking for maybe the verse that God would want you to internalize this week. The verse that might be worth writing down on a card and putting it somewhere where you're gonna see it every day and saying, God, I want this verse to become a mantra, something that I can trust and take hope in. And just to give you a couple of tips, Psalm 37, four that I'm about to reread is one of the most popularly memorized verses in all of scripture. Uh, the one that I've chosen this week is Psalm 37, six. That's the one that just hit me really powerfully. I thought that's what I need the reminder of this week. So as I go through these again, let the promises of God be powerful for you and maybe be fishing for what he would want you to really build into your heart this week. So here we go. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
and then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him and he will help you. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. You see, our natural tendency is that we, we try to increase our future hope by focusing on the future. But what scripture shows us is that we actually increase our future hope when we focus on the present and when we peacefully release God to do what he's going to do in the future. Which brings us to our third and final moment of divine grammar. And before we get there, I just wanna, wanna commend you for staying uh, in it with me. I'm sure that you have paid more attention to grammar in the last 20 minutes than you have in the last 20 years. And so that's a lot, that's a hard thing to do. So thank you for being in it with me, but, but this is the one. This next thing is the, is the piece of grammar that can transform your life and save you if you will let it. And it's a little foreign to us. It's not a thing we're used to thinking about. So, so it's gonna take some work, but, but, but press into it with me because it will change your life. It's called the prophetic present, uh, the prophetic perfect. And what it means in a nutshell is that God's actions are simultaneously already and not yet. And so here's what I wanna teach you about Hebrew. That Hebrew, just like English, does not have a future tense. However, Hebrew also doesn't have a present tense or a past tense. <laughs> they didn't think about the world that way. Uh, we divide the world into past, present, and future. The, the ancient Hebrews, they did not. And so for Hebrew, there were only two verb tenses, only two states of being that a verb could be in. A verb is either already completed or not yet completed. That's it. Any action that you can do has either been completed, and that's how you'll talk about it, that's how you'll conjugate it, it's been completed, or it has not yet been completed, and that's how you'll talk about it. And the, the term for those was not past, present, or future, because they didn't think about it that way. The term for those was perfect, because that's actually the technical term for already completed. Perfect didn't used to mean never messes up, never sins, you know, perfect in that way. Perfect originally just meant complete, done, finished. And so in Hebrew, you had two tenses, the perfect tense, actions that were already done, already completed, already finished. And then you had the imperfect tense. And the imperfect tense was all of the actions that have not yet been done, not yet been completed. They are still imperfect. Now what happens is the perfect tense tends to line up with the past. Because if an action has been completed, that means it probably happened before in the past. And the imperfect tense ha tends to line up with the present and the future. Because if, a, if an action has not been completed, that's because you're currently doing it or you're going to do it. And so that tends to be the present and future. And so what happens in Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is they will put verbs in either the perfect or the imperfect, and we will just tend to translate them and think of them as being in either past tense or perfect tense. But that's not actually how it's thought of at the time. Let me go back to Psalm 37 uh, and show you uh, how, this, how this plays out. So Psalm 37, verse 37. Look at those who are honest and good for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. Again, what a beautiful and simple promise. And by the way, if you also want maybe an easier memory verse, this is a good one because it's Psalm 37, 37. It's just the same number. So it's way easier to memorize than the other ones. So maybe pick on that one. But look at this, a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They have no future, no future at all. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them and they find shelter in him. These are the closing two verses of Psalm 37. Again, they're beautiful just in their own right, powerful and helpful, but I want you to notice the grammar of this. All of these verbs, the Lord rescues, the Lord helps, the Lord saves, they're in the imperfect tense. 
which means this is a perfectly appropriate way to put them in this kind of present tense way, but would have been just as, as legitimate to translate this as the Lord will rescue the godly. The Lord will help. The Lord will save because it's the same tense in Hebrew, but it would have a different feel in English, wouldn't it? And if you go and look at the different translations, they will kind of alternate between. Sometimes they'll say it in the present tense like they do here. Sometimes they'll say it in the future because here's the point. What they're trying to say is it's both things. That God is here in this moment rescuing and helping and saving. And God also will in the future rescue and help and save. There's this powerful nuance that God's actions are happening right here and now as we speak. And they're also going to happen in the future. And they're both included in that same Hebrew form, verb form, the imperfect. But now here's, here's where the Hebrew prophets did something profound. This is called the prophetic perfect. That sometimes, and only when talking about the verbs of God, only when talking about God's actions of rescue and help and salvation, the prophets would put the verb in the perfect tense. What we think of as the past tense, because what they're saying is God is going to rescue us in the future, but... God's promises are so certain, we can be so assured that they would write about it in the perfect and say it's as good as done. His actions of rescue and salvation are complete. They're perfect. And so they would put it in the prophetic perfect tense because they're saying it's not a thing we hope is gonna happen in the future. It's not a thing that God might do. Maybe he'll rescue us or help us or save us. They're saying it's as good as done. God has already rescued, helped, and saved us. God has already gone ahead. And this is so important and it's a thing that we'll just miss if, if we don't pay attention because when we think about the future tense, we think that it's future for God too. That it's something that hasn't happened for us, which means it hasn't happened for God. And yet what, what the scripture shows, what the grammar reveals is he has already gone ahead. He's not going to go ahead at some point. He has already been to the future and he's calling out back to us and he's saying, guys, the future's fine. And I can't wait for you to catch up to where I've already gone. See, what we're saying is we don't have to stress about maybe our life will work out, maybe our kids will grow up okay, maybe these things will, will be blessed or, or not. What, we're, what the scripture teaches is that God has already made a way. He's already gone into the future. He has created that existence and he's in it now. And we're just waiting until we catch up. And that's how we get rid of the uncertainty and the fear of the future not by trying to control it ourselves, but by knowing that God has already created it and we're just waiting to discover what's coming. This is the promise God makes to each and every one of us. This is why our future is assured. And what blows my mind is that 2000 years ago, this guy started walking around and doing miracles and saying lots of confusing things because one of the confusing things he said was that he claimed the attributes of God. Just like our God is in all times, all places, Jesus himself claimed to be always, always. He said to the people attacking him, before Abraham was, I am. Or like a good shepherd, he said to his followers, I am with you, always. Or last week that, that he hems us in behind and Jesus has his hand upon our past. And then he promises that he has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. And if you don't know that story, let, let, me, let me make sure you hear it today. That, that on the most important weekend in, in history, when Jesus knew that he was hours away from being tortured to death, he looked around at his friends his apostles, and he saw that they were afraid, fearful, uncertain about their future. And he spoke these words of comfort to them. And I want you to notice the divine grammar that's underneath all of this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. That's the Hithpael. He's saying, don't work yourself up. It's gonna be okay. 
Present tense, trust in God. And by trusting God, that means you're also trusting in me. And then he pointed the way he had. He said, there is more than enough room for you in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going ahead to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus, went ahead of us in life, not just in the sufferings and the trials and the difficulties, he went ahead of us all the way into death. And then he came out the other side and he rose again from the dead and he said, look, I'm here, I got there first. And now I'm telling you, you don't have to worry about this future thing anymore because this one divine miracle changed our futures forever. And didn't just change our futures forever. It, it even changed this church and, and even the name of this church. Some of you haven't been here uh, as long and so you might not know this, but this church is 170 years old and it's changed its name a couple of times uh, in that time frame. But for over a hundred years, this church was called St. John. And that name, it had some, some issues with it that was keeping us from accomplishing uh, the mission that God accomplished. And so we knew we needed to change it. And, and we knew we didn't wanna be named after a, a dead saint anymore. It just wasn't working for us. Although if you are gonna be named after a dead saint, John is definitely the right one to go with. I'm glad it wasn't St. James the Lesser. <laughs> that's, that's why you don't do that. But we knew that the, the dead saint thing wasn't working. And we also knew, we, we knew that we did want our church to be named after a car. <laughs> Look, don't ask me why, it is what it is, okay? All right, and we knew. And so we spent months doing research uh, and market testing and feedback groups and hours of test driving, let me tell you. And after all of that time, we, we finally narrowed it down. We narrowed it down to two possible names for our church. It was gonna be one of these. <laughs> now, you think you know, because you know the outcome of the story. You think you know how this story went. You don't know. You don't know that these two names nearly split the church. I know. It's, it's disturbing to think about it. It's hard to think, but, but people got really heated about these two names. People took sides. People felt very passionately about this. And you had some people saying like, we're an American church. We should be named after an American car. That's the right thing. And other people were on the other side and they were saying, we're all about quality and excellence. And Nissan is way more reliable than Chevy's. That's the one we should go with. I know this is really hard to hear about guys. This is, this is upsetting to see just how, how humans can get heated and mad and, uh, and, and take sides on things. I, I know it's tough, but it's important because it's a part of our story. It's a part of our history. And so what happened was this got intense. Five hour town hall meetings, the parking lot became a war zone. I'm just telling you, there were people, they were taking bumper stickers that one of like Calvin peeing on the Chevy logo and they were slapping that on people's cars without permission. Somebody was like slashing the tires of any Nissan that, that even dared to drive on to our parking lot. I know, I know this is disturbing to hear about, but you know, we're humans. We got a dark side to our, our nature and, and, and we, we, get, we get passionate about these things. It's just, this is how the sausage gets made. I, I'm sorry. But, but in the midst of the mayhem, it will not surprise you to hear that I, was the voice of reason and diplomacy. And I said, guys, 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 it, this is okay. We don't have to argue about this. We don't have to, we don't have to fight. We don't have to let, let all of our sinful nature take over this. There is a right solution here. And I know what it is. You see, in scripture, Jesus himself said that he has gone ahead to prepare a way for us in heaven. And the Bible is consistent in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that it describes heaven as, as a eternal, everlasting party. And so I know what the name of our church should be. This should be the name of our church. <laughs> Fiesta Lutheran Church. It's perfect. They didn't listen to me. I don't know why. But all kidding aside, this is why I love the name of our church. Because we are not trailblazers, boldly going where no one has gone before, trying to carve out some future for ourselves in the midst of uncertainty. That's not us, we are pathfinders because we have a God who has gone ahead and he has made a way. 
our Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And what he's promised us is that he is in the future already. He's waiting for us to catch up to him. And so all we need to do now is not be bold and dangerous adventurers. It's peaceful followers of our Lord, trusting that he has laid out a path and that it is there, it's there for us to find. And that if we just spend our lives finding and following the path that Jesus has already laid out because he went ahead, then we will find peace and hope and a trust in God that our future is ready and waiting for us. And it's everything that he promises it will be. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I am so grateful that you have gone ahead, that you are our God of the future tense. And so Lord, here and now help us to live in the present that you have given us. Help us to own and have agency over the actions and the choices that you've given us to make here and now. And Lord, I pray that those choices would increase our future hope. Lord, give us glimpses of this place that you've already gone. Help us to trust that the path we follow will not end in a dead end. It won't disappear in the midst of nothing, but that this path will lead us faithfully and securely all the way home to you for our everlasting future. We pray this in your holy name, amen. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new here, you can find helpful links to resources in the description below or on our website at pathfinderstl.org. While you're there, you can also find our message podcast, which allows you to listen to the weekend messages whenever you're on the go. Lastly, a reminder to like, share, and comment. We love getting to hear from you. Well, that's it for today. I hope you have a blessed week.